we're just talking about LA to Orange County, which might as well be two different states because <laughs> of traffic yeah, on a normal right, day. Right. But um, how do you guys manage the the culture between offices? Man, you just punched me in the gut. Um, this is uh, <laughs> this has been a hot button of mine for a long time. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. This episode is brought to you by Yellow Images. Guys, I'm really excited to share with you our latest sponsor, Yellow Images. There are a ton of places on the web right now to find ready-to-use solutions, but let me tell you why I'm excited to be the first to introduce you to Yellow Images. It's the number one marketplace with more than 40,000 premium mockups, fonts, 360 images, and a ton of other graphic assets to really make your job easier. Not to mention all those textures, patterns, presets, and UX UI kits. But there are really two things that I'm most excited about. Number one are their mockups. You know how some clients are like, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, Yellow Images has mockups that are high resolution with great lighting and shadows that will really help you sell your latest design or brand pitch by helping your clients see what it's going to look like. And number two is Yellow isn't just here to provide you with amazing assets, they wanna help you out too. So if you're seeking to create some passive income, become an author, put your work up for sale at Yellow Images and start getting paid for your own mockups, 360 images and fonts. Lastly, like any good podcast sponsor, Yellow Images has come through with a great offer. If you sign up today, they have a limited number of discounts just for our listeners. Head over to yellowimages.com and be sure to enter promo code obsessed at checkout. That's yellowimages.com and use promo code obsessed at checkout. Show them some love. I think you're going to dig what they're up to. Now back to the show. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with Carlos Musquez, Executive Creative Director of ELA. Los, as his friends call him, is the creative lead for ELA. His deep agency roots at Omnicom under Alcone Marketing saw him developing and designing his best-in-class campaigns for major brands such as the California Lottery, Warner Music Group, Nestle, Logitech, LG Mobile, eBay, Sony, Diageo, TikTok, Western Digital, PepsiCo, and Disney, to name just a few. Carlos lives by the philosophy that an idea is only as good as its execution, and passion and craft are what turn good ideas into award-winning ideas. In his free time, Los extends his love of craft to the world of home brewing, crafting ales, and designing labels. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Los Musquez. Okay, kids, all the way from Los Angeles, I'm chatting with the one and only Los Mosquez. Los, welcome to Obsessed Show. Hey, Josh, how are you? Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, it's awesome to have you here. And I guess just to kind of timestamp these, you know, we're we're always a couple of weeks of recording before we go live. But at the time of recording, it's May 2020. Everybody's just starting to talk about coming out of our little COVID hibernation. Um, I'm curious what you're seeing and feeling, especially in the creative world and especially in Los Angeles, because we're here in Indianapolis and I'm sure things are maybe wildly different. How is ELA adjusting to all of this? We're adjusting great. It's, uh, it's not without its challenges, obviously, but what I, you know, what, what can you say about creativity, right? Creativity continues no matter where you're at, what you're doing. Um, whether you're in COVID-19 lockdown or if you're um, collectively with a, with a big group, you know, creative people find a way to be creative. And with us, pretty much, I think that the goal for us was how to replicate the culture and the spirit of that, uh, you know, being together. There's something very, very beautiful. We're very physical people here when it comes to the work. We like to print stuff out, put it on the walls, have creative conversations, all of that stuff. So we try to replicate that, um, you know, with the tools that we have digitally now, and that's been going pretty well. A lot more Google Hangouts, all of that stuff. We're doing our podcast today via, you know, a Zoom call, which is great. So I think everybody in the world is using this now, uh, not without it. uh, it's it's fun um, guest stars from pets and babies and everything else. But we, we welcome <laughs> all of that stuff for sure. Um, everybody's part of our creative team. But in LA, I think you know. What I've really noticed is not really about LA. It's I think it's it's globally, right? And 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 what I've started to notice is, you know, when you give creatives a, a new playground, 
new awesome creative things emerge. There's there's yeah, no totally. question. I'm sure you're seeing it. I, I am just absolutely blown away by the greater creativity that 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 follows this. Right. Um, I think that ultimately this is teaching us how to be more connected and how to collaborate um, across any situation. Not that we didn't know how to do that before, but I think it's it's one of those things where you go, creativity isn't about a single room or a single person. It's always about collaboration, sharing ideas and, and being students of the world and seeing what's out there. And I, I'm seeing a lot of that start to emerge today, which gives me, I don't want to say hope because it's not about hope. I'm optimistically positive and, um, and positively optimistic all the time. Uh, <laughs> but what I do see is new ways and I love the new way. That's what drives yeah, me. That's good. I've been doing this for a long, long time. And Man, I got to tell you, you know, if, if you think you can rest on your laurels, you're wrong. You, you just can't. I learn something every day and I, I learn from everybody around me. So learning a lot in, in, like I said, in LA, I'm, you know, the streets might be empty. Um, what we love about that is the clear view of some of the beautiful street art and stuff that we get to see around us and, mm-hmm. and things that we maybe take for granted on a day-to-day basis. So um, I think creativity and the culture of creativity is thriving um, and only going to get better from here. Are you guys downtown LA? We are in the media district up closer to Hollywood. Okay, cool. So outside nice. of downtown. Yeah, I had a chance to uh, hang out a little bit in LA uh, last fall for the Adobe Max conference, which was just a great way to see the city on foot because, you know, the, none of the hotels were nearby. <laughs> so they were all like a mile plus walk. So you just take a different path every time. And for sure, the street art and different murals and stuff was super cool to check out all that stuff. It's pretty awesome. That's a good point because, you know, I spent a lot of time in different cities, uh, at least in the U.S. here. And L.A. is a really unique city that way because, you know, it was talking about design, right? It was never really meant to be a city like New York. I think maybe, you know, at one point in time, it started out that way. But the, the design of the city itself and how we live in it was a commuter city. So we have pockets. We have not like boroughs like in New York, much, much further apart. So, you know, public transportation is a little bit challenging here. It's very different. So it's meant to be driven. Um, you can walk that song. Nobody walks in LA. Eh, a lot of people walk in LA, but LA is pretty darn big. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, not everything's right there. It's not all walkable. And, and you know, it, there's always an Uber, Uber ride involved in some way, but there's a, there's a lot to it. And you definitely get um, different flavors from Hollywood to Santa Monica to Venice, you know, oh, yeah. uh, even out to downtown. I'm not saying there weren't any Uber rides involved in that visit, but uh, I really want to ask you more about ELA. But sure. before I get too far down the, the Los Angeles rabbit hole, um, tell us a little bit about your origin story and how you found yourself in the agency world. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I got to back way up. Um, I'll be, I'll try to be as brief as I can in this. But uh, when I was in high school, I played a lot of music and art was just a, um, it was a hobby. I loved to draw. I, I loved, I, I knew I loved design, but I didn't really know why I loved design. I didn't really know what graphic design was. I didn't really know, you know, really anything about it. And then when I got into college, I was playing music, but I was playing music for so long. It's kind of like a jazz guy, all that stuff. And I loved all of that. And I just kind of got to a place where most people do where you just get burnt out. And you're like, I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, when I was playing music, I was like, wow, there's some guys around me that are, you know, and girls that were just incredible. I mean, they were just so freaking incredible. I'm like, I'm never going to be that good. And, and I kind of asked myself, why do you think that you're never going to be that good? And I think part of it was that music is more of a hobby. I I like it, but Mm -hmm. it's not what drives me. There was something deeper. So I ended up taking one, uh, sort of art design class. And I realized at that time, like, Oh my God, there's more creative misfits out there like me. And so I (laughs) fell deep into that. I, I thought I wanted to get into like, you know, programming computers and stuff. Cause I was kind of, you know, I mentioned this earlier, um, in our conversation before we started this, that I, I kind of fashioned myself the, you know, last of the old first of the new, where I was kind of, you know, right in between where computers really started to become ubiquitous with design and all that. So I was fascinated with technology and, and a little bit with art. And then I kind of realized that those two things can go hand in hand. And at the time I was working at a video store, um, you know, very much like any college thing, you know, where you're like, you're, you're, you're working at a video store and, you know, this guy comes in and he used to, he used to see me all the time sketching movie posters. And it's very funny because I started at this with going, I want to make movie posters. That was my thing. So when I kind of yeah. understood that there's this thing called graphic design and he turned me on to that and, 
then throughout school, I learned a lot more about graphic design. So wait a minute, I can put the computer together as a tool with my love of art. And those two things can, can come together. That's how I got into design or graphic design. And then uh, coming out of college, um, you know, I was fortunate enough when I went to art school to have one instructor uh, that worked at Foot Cone and Belding at the time. And he was a senior art director there and he was teaching and he was probably the most real person I've ever met in my life when it came to my college career. And he said, look, man, listen, school's great. You're going to learn a lot, but you're going to learn a lot more on the job. And this is how it really is out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he shared his work with me. He shared what they were doing at Foot Cone and Belding. And uh, I thought, that's really cool. And what I loved about it was the notion of persuasive communication and how graphic design or art uh, you know, plays a role in that and in, in, in really thinking about how somebody perceives a brand or perceives a product or, or makes a decision to buy something. So that's where I really started to net out. And then I got my first job. I was a lifer in the Omnicom business there for a long time. So I got, to, I got a call um, from a headhunter at the time to go work at Alcon. And when I went into Alcon, it was, it was old school, man. I was sitting in a stat camera room shooting stats for mechanicals, kids listening. That means that you made Photoshop files out of paper. Um, back right. in the day, <laughs> um, layers exist for a reason. And we made layers out of paper. The camera was like the size of a Volkswagen. It was the size of a Volkswagen. And, and you were, you know, you were hand setting typography and cutting Ruby lifts and doing all that stuff. And I was making presentation boards. They had Burger King as a client at the time. And, you know, everything was done with illustrators by hand. And, you know, I was photocopying stuff and cutting them out and making the presentation boards. And when I got into that environment and I got exposed to that world, it was, it was Alice in Wonderland and down the rabbit hole. I mean, I yeah. just fell in love with it and absolutely never looked back. And, and what I started to realize when I, when I dug a little deeper and started to look at like Helmut Krohn and became a student of advertising and, you know, Fernbach and all of those guys and how they really perceived the persuasive communication or the, 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 the power of persuasive communication and, and how artistry goes hand in hand with that. I thought, wow, I can really make a difference. I can really do something. And I thought, why is there so much crap in the world that I see? I don't like commercials. I don't like some of the design that I see. And I couldn't understand why people would do that, right? And, 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 I, and I thought, well, maybe I could change that. Maybe I can turn my, what I thought was a hobby into an actual career. And uh, 28 years later, yeah, it worked. <laughs> you know, that, that sounds like a very similar sentiment to... Um what I think Massimo Vignelli famously said that he's, he's fighting vulgarity, I think was sort of the, the paraphrase was this idea of there's so much ugliness out there in the world that like he was just so against making these ugly things and how do you make more beautiful things? Um, and, and I think you put it maybe a little more practically yeah. <laughs> how, how you might be able to solve that problem. Um, but that, that's a really cool background. Um, tell us a little bit about ELA. What, what's kind of the shape of that agency? How, how large are you guys and what kind of roles are there at that shop? Yeah. So I got to, I got to give you the origin story of my origin story with ELA too. So coming mm -hmm. out of why I got into advertising. So I worked in that Omnicom space, as you said, for a very, very long time. And those of you listening that know Omnicom, you know, it's a big conglomerate. It's, it's full of a lot of different types of agencies, um, you know, from, you know, uh, big design shops to, uh, advertising agencies, digital shops, you name it. There's everything, PR, uh, experiential. And uh, I spent the majority of my career working with Omnicom and, and those big clients. That was wonderful. But what I noticed was um, there was a fracturing of, of the industry. So as technology caught up with, um, or I should say, as humanity caught up with technology, we started to use our tools differently. And we started to have more of a global conversation. And we started to move a lot faster and, um, you know, a, a, a lot of people call it the, the holy cow, but they use a different word, um, moments in the world, like, holy cow, we put a man on the moon. And then, you know, you go, holy cow, color TV, you know, when Apple started to come out with technology that blew us away every year, and now it's become kind of expected. And, and, and I decided to remove myself from that situation because those big agencies started to become lumbering. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very difficult, the traditional agency model, 
to uh, maneuver. And I, I equate it to a cruise ship versus a speedboat. And after doing that for so long, and, and you know, I'll never knock big agency because I, I love it. And they do some amazing work today to still. And, and those big conglomerates are, are awesome for sure. And I couldn't thank the industry so much for what they've given me in, in my career. But there was something very fascinating to me about being independent and coming to an independent shop and doing things a little bit differently. Um, I felt like I was having Groundhog's Day, kind of like today, but um, you know, where you're having similar <laughs> conversations and 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 how you're approaching your job or your work on a day to day basis was a, was a little bit, you know, kind of same same. So I decided I was going to um, do something different, and I didn't know if I was going to open up my own shop again or or what I was going to do. Um, so a mutual friend. Um, introduced me to uh, a guy named Andre Phillip, who's the CEO and, and owner of ELA, and now my creative partner here. And um, I met him and he comes from the entertainment industry. So movie trailers, movie posters, all of that. So go back to what I said earlier, when I was sitting in a video store, I had never done a lot of movie stuff in the past, right? I was ancillarily attached to it through Warner Music and some other stuff and working promotionally with, with films like Star Trek and different things. Um, but I thought, well, well, let me go have you know a coffee with this guy. Everything starts with a coffee. So I sat down with him, and he asks me, uh, you know, what's your hopes and dreams? What do you want to do? Why would you want to do this? And and I kind of asked him the same question. What we realized was we were saying the same thing. The old model is not working. There's something broken about the old model. So why don't we come at it from a different place? So six years ago, I joined ELA. They had been in business for about twelve years, kind of flying under the radar. I didn't know ELA at all. Um, and I came in going, okay, let's create something together that has a greater purpose than, than where we are you know, today, where we stood in, in, in the world at that particular time. And um, so we went off and we like to say we jumped off the cliff together to grow wings on the way down. <laughs> um, that's, that's how these things work. You kind of have to take a little bit of a risk. And I was ready for that risk you know, to do something a little bit different, walk away from the stability of a big company and, and go into an independent shop because you know, it's, it's good and bad both, right? Because you don't have a big company behind you to give you the support. You kind of turn around and look in the mirror. That's kind of what it is, but you get to affect all the levels of this. So when I met Andre, you know, we kind of high-fived each other. We had a lot of philosophies that, that made a lot of sense and we were off and running. And today um, we're about 50 people. We have two offices, um, one here, our main headquarters in, in Los Angeles. And we have another office in Orange County um, that predominantly services uh, Thermidor. Um, Thermador being a luxury appliance um, company. Uh, they're a legacy for us, been a long time client. We love them. Um, and that's something really interesting for us. You know, our clients, our family, we finish each other's sentences. It's really important for us to have a great rapport and great relationship with them. So I think that's where good work, great work comes from, is being open and honest and be able to have those conversations. So today I sat in, you know, the LA office predominantly, but I'm between the two offices. And uh, the offices are very different. The one here in LA, uh, you, you'll get a kick out of this. It's an old architectural uh, studio. So it's got brick and it's like very raw materials and, and wood. And, and um, the, the gentleman that owned it, he just passed away, but his family still owns it. He, he originated the building and it still has a lot of that flavor to it, which I love. So it kind of feels architectural in, in nature. And a lot of little studios have come and gone in this place. So uh, it's pretty cool to be, you know, walk the hallowed grounds of a, a, yeah, of a cool uh, Los history Angeles yeah, the history. And our shop in Orange County is extremely different. It's very high end, very modern, designed by Gensler. Mm. Um, we partner with them and just re reopen that. And anybody looking to check that out can go to our website and, and look at the press page. There's some cool photos and stuff on there. But uh, couldn't be polar opposite in terms of design. But why I say that um, is because we have, and I'll touch on this a little bit later maybe, but we have a philosophy here that says what we make in here has lasting and great effects out there. And that gets us to the notion of where you make is as important as what you make. So mm -hmm. you know, what I will say about our shop is that each is designed purposely to inspire and purposely to um, you know, really support that creative culture and, and, and the creative philosophies that we try to instill in everybody in the way that we work. I love that, what we make in here and how it impacts what's out there. I think mean, it's just such a cool way to think about it. Um, so what, I mean, obviously nobody's having a typical day right now. What, what might a typical day in theory look like for you? And I'm sure you know, every day is a little bit different, but like in your role, what, what are your duties and 
um, and how do you typically go about your day? Yeah, I, you know, it's really interesting because things are very different today than they were, you know, a few months ago for sure. But at the same time, it's it's kind of the it's kind of the same. I, I like to back up a lot <laughs> to go forward. But I saw a chart once that talked about the the, um, the programs that designers use as they go throughout their career. And oftentimes, as an executive, creative lead, you do a lot less hands-on Illustrator, Photoshop work, and a lot more um, Google Slides and spreadsheets, um, which <laughs> right. doesn't make me happy all the time. But you know, I've I've become very proficient at that side of the job too. But as a typical um, typical day for me, I don't think it's changed much over the course of my career. To be quite honest with you, I, I really I'm I'm a I'm a creature of habit when it comes to my rituals, so to speak, because I realized, yes, I want to get out of my rituals and out of my habits, but I kind of need them because mm-hmm. the programmatic aspect of, of life, you know, really helps me. I have, you know, a family with four kids, um, three mm-hmm. of which are still at home and, and a grandchild living with us. So it's, it's kind of, you know, that takes a lot of time, um, for sure. And they, they are absolutely, I always say the, the best thing I ever created is my family. And, and, uh, I'm always inspired by the things that they're doing today, but I get up, same thing, like everybody else does. I get up, get dressed, do my thing, get my coffee, and I sit down. The first thing I do is I go online and I start looking at Ad Age and Ad Week and design, um, you know, blogs and and do research. I try to dedicate at least an hour of my time uh, a day to that in the, in the morning. And the reason I do that is just to kind of level set my brain against. It's not about what I made yesterday. It's about what I'm going to make today, and. Um, we all need a little inspiration. And sometimes I just, you know, you just need to kind of cleanse your mental palate. So that's what that, that's, I do that regardless. And then, you know, um, the majority of my time when it comes to um, my job is, is it quite frankly, planning, uh, you know, having foresight into a project and how you're going to approach that project is everything, you know, and I've gotten off track um, for sure. Lots of times, you know, we all are uh, challenged with creativity doesn't, it's magical, right? Sometimes it happens in an hour. Sometimes it happens in 10 days. Sometimes it happens in two years. Um, you don't know when it's going to hit you, but we always try to walk, a, walk a, away from a deadline versus towards a deadline. And what I mean by that is it's easy to go, it's due next Friday. And we go, okay, cool. We're going to have to present something next Friday, but it's a little bit more difficult to go, it's due next Friday. What are the steps, the milestones I have to hit? So I do a lot of that and helping the team understand what their milestones are, hitting their marks and knowing that at the end of the day, well, there's some things that say, if this, then this sort of approach, right? We have to hit those marks. So a lot of my day is, is done that way. Um, a lot of my day is creative direction with the creative director team. And that is talking about the culture. That's talking about the projects. Um, you know, even Andre, as CEO and chief creative officer here, as my counterpart, we are in the work every day. And we talk about the work. We put it up. We try to have creative conversations. So um, I might not be physically in Photoshop, but I use my Sharpie every single day and it's still the best tool that I ever had. And, um, you know, my eyes and my brain, and you can't shut that off. I don't care what level of your career, um, a creative person never stops being creative. So I'm still making, I'm still concepting, I'm still directing, I'm still working with the team to help guide them and help them see things. Um, you know, we like to say it's about like, you know, it's kind of hard for people to see the sausage being made because it's it gets messy. But um, I love making. I love getting my hands dirty. I love that messy middle, right? I love the point of, you know, we say part of our brand is um, the beauty is hiding in the chaos. And creativity is chaotic sometimes. A lot of people are scared of it and a lot of people are afraid to dig at it. So a lot of my day is helping the team understand and grapple with the puzzle pieces. Creatively, nothing really scares me except being the only creative person in a room. I guess that's probably the thing that scares me when it all hinges on you. And you're like, whoa, nobody else is creative. I don't think that that's true. But uh, yeah, I like to um, I like to get my hands dirty. I like to roll up my sleeves and, and, and really get into the problem solving. I always say, and everybody listening, if you don't feel this way, please change the way you think. Creativity is extremely powerful. You know, clients um, come to you because they can't solve their creative problems. Um, they ask us to solve extremely difficult marketing problems, branding problems, um, visual language problems, you name it. There's a lot of things out there. And we always like to say if they could have, they would have. They're focused on other aspects. They're oftentimes very close to their business and they can't see it. Um, distance is everything. So I love to get physical distance, put stuff up, look at it from a new perspective, all of that. So a typical day, 
really revolves around me being in meeting jail, which I like to say, um, you know, constantly uh, today more than ever is just, you know, hangouts, hangouts, hangouts. And then, you mm-hmm. know, trying to give the team directions, helping them find a path. You know, we like to say that we use this analogy. It's pretty interesting. Um, a plane will fail its way from Los Angeles to New York City. And what we mean by that is if it's left to its own devices, it will go off course. And you'll find yourself in the Gulf of Mexico. And then you're going to realize, wait a minute, we're not supposed to be here. We're supposed to be in New York City. The only way that that plane gets to New York City is course correcting. So my job is to ensure that the team is constantly, consistently course corrected towards the goal, towards the thing that we're working on, whatever that ends up being. Do you feel like it's your job to be the course correction or are you coaching the team to course correct themselves? Both. I think that, you know, man, you bring up a really, really good point. Um, something that really frustrates me today and, and um, it's just sad is that there's a lack of teaching happening in, at least in my industry. Mm-hmm. When I grew up in this industry, I was over the shoulder. I was I had people behind me. I, I spent every waking minute that I had with um, somebody flanking me and, and learning from them and, and just dig in and dig in. It is up to you to learn for sure. However, you know, I was blessed to have some wonderful, some wonderful mentors. Um, one of which his name is Luis Camano and Luis, if you're listening to this, let's go get an espresso together sometime. But, uh, he gave me my first shots at things. And, and I remember I was reading magazines, um, at the time that were like wired magazine and stuff. And he came to me and he drops a bunch of communication arts magazines on my desk. And he said, listen, um, you're not going to become a better designer art director by reading wired. Sure, it might help you. Read these and come talk to me after you've looked at all of them cover to cover. There must have been 25 of them. Hmm. And um, that changed my life forever. So the, the notion of teaching is really important. So I think getting back to your question is, yes, it's my job to course correct, but it's also my job to teach somebody how to course correct, what to look for, those warning signs, those things that you go, wait a minute, something's off, something's wrong. What's not, you know, why do I feel this way? Paying attention to your emotions, self-awareness, all the things that come along with, with the, uh, you know, emotional connection to the work that we have. Um, very important. And, and I see uh, very few people teaching that today. And I, I hope that more people at a, a, you know, higher level start to spend more time with their team and teach them how they got to where they got and what they look at. Yeah, I'd love that you're talking about um, kind of the coaching and the teaching aspect. Um, I, I gotta imagine that gets especially challenging when you have two offices. So what is it like, you talked about culture before a little bit, what is it like trying to create consistency within the two offices or do you guys strive for that? Or how do you, how do you manage, um, that beast? I mean, even knowing that it's, we're just talking about LA to Orange County, which might as well be two different States because <laughs> of traffic yeah, on a normal right, day, right. but, um, how do you guys manage the, the culture between offices? Man, you just punched me in the gut. Um, this is, uh, <laughs> this has been a hot button of mine for a long time. I mean, back in the day, um, when I worked at, at Alcone and, and, you know, other agencies, there's, you know, bi-coastal agencies and it's mm-hmm. always, you know, two physical buildings, no matter if it's a, a, you know, a town apart or across the globe culture is a big, a big issue. And, and not necessarily that they have to be exactly the same, but there has to be some core principles. So, you know, this kind of gets me to, um, a little bit of a branding exercise that we had for ourselves as ELA. So, you know, you guys all heard me talk about how I met Andre and over the last six years, we've been making this thing called ELA and, and, and we set out to make an agency, an ad agency. And, you know, it's part design shop, part ad agency, part entertainment shop. And we dabbled in music and entertainment. We've done a lot of different things. And it wasn't until we decided that we were going to stop trying to make a quote unquote agency and start trying to make a creative brand that things changed. And when we made a creative brand, um, we're an agency that has a brand book, just like any other brand would. We wrote down the things that, you know, he and I, sort of the ideals that we had on a day-to-day basis. And, you know, people used to say, gosh, you guys are, your work ethic is insane and you guys are crazy in the way you work and it's always chaotic, but you make the best, coolest things and how you get there is insane. And, and we decided, let's, how do we do that? And we, in our brand book, we wrote down core principles and, and anybody going to our website will see some of those core principles. And, and, you know, I'll just touch on them now. We don't have to go through all of them, but, you know, the, the notion that 
It's how we work. So once we started to talk about the how we get to something versus just the why, it is about the why for sure. Um, then that 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 sort of permeates the culture because now we're all about the work and the way that we work. It's a it's a way of being. It becomes more of a lifestyle stance brand than it does, um, you know, a, an ad agency or or even just a company that has you know. Um, you know, uh, Taco Tuesdays and and Fun Fridays and hula hoops and that it, it's, it transcends all of that stuff. All that stuff's cool, and you know, I'm sure if you work at like a Google, they have a lot of that stuff. But they also have core principles that 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 drive them, and and that's where the rubber meets the road for us, right? And it's it's philosophy and it's practice. So philosophy is nothing without putting it into practice. If you're not putting it into practice, it's just an idea. Mm-hmm. An idea as a creative person. Um, live in our own heads forever. But until you put it down on a, that big, blank, scary piece of paper for the world to see it, it, it doesn't mean anything. So um, we we practice that. We try to practice putting philosophy into practical application. And our core values of our brands, like no one's going to ask you to be great. Why not just be great today? That's a core value, right? Um, the fact that we do creative sprints, that we are our uh, design philosophy or way of working is early and often. Don't hide it. Don't, I don't want to see it three weeks from now. I want to see it every hour on the hour. Let's talk about it. That helps permeate culture. And you want to find those people as well. I say with sunshine in their brains that, that really come in and just positive optimism, bottomless optimism, as we like to say, and, you know, aren't afraid to take the hits. And I think that's how you bridge those two gaps because every creative person listening to this right now knows everybody's a critic. (laughs) And, you know, there's always, you know, especially in commercial marketing here, um, yeah, there's always guns pointed at you. Everybody yeah. thinks they can do your job and everybody thinks they can do it better. Um, and, and now with the, you know, ubiquitousness, if you will, of technology, everybody can on some level pick up an iPhone and everybody's Fellini, right? It's like, it's unbelievable. The stuff that's being, I, I, I love and hate it all at the same time, but to really bring those two offices together or any offices for that matter, I think it has to be based on your culture and your culture has to be based on your reason for being and, and, and how you do something versus just the why you do it. So we really try to focus on our way of working, which really em- employs an entertainment model, which was different for me um, in traditional advertising. It's like, you know, pencil sketches, kind of loose first rounds, kind of figure it out as you go. Production team is going to figure it out. You know, um, I like to stay close the loop on the idea. And in, in Andre's world, it was like, what are you kidding me? No way. We have to produce 35 different comps for a Netflix campaign and uh, they need it in two weeks and we don't have any assets, but it all has to be completely finished. And I was like, blew my mind because they're true, true, true artists. When you think about key artists, those guys are painters. They're, they're, they're incredible. And mm-hmm. taking those two worlds and matching them together really helped us to develop out a way of being that permeates both offices. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And the market seems to have responded with clients like TikTok and Western Digital and PepsiCo and Disney. Um, I'm curious if, like, does that philosophy become the thing that attracts the clients or are you guys doing a really good job of sussing out like who's a good fit for you or are there particular red flags that you look for in a potential client partner? Like, What does that look like for you guys? I mean, the question behind the question here is like, how do you get such amazing clients? Well, number one, by through your work. I mean, that at the end of the day, nothing speaks louder than the thing that's left in the world, right? Uh, mm-hmm. When I was a young creative, one of my creative directors told me, "Listen, you know, doesn't matter what the budget is, doesn't matter how you know how much you think it should be a certain thing, and you know the the client's wife's dog, you know, hates it, whatever. There's always an excuse. What's left is the thing that's on the wall, and it's either good or bad, and it has your name all over it." what do you want it to be? Hmm. And that profoundly affected me. <laughs> I was like, right. Oh crap. <laughs> you know, like, you know, the pressure, you know, the weight of the world's on you at that point, because again, that's where we get to today. That was years, 20 years ago. And today we still say what we make in here has great, great and lasting effects out there. Right. Because we have a responsibility to, to the world out there. So when we think about that, I think that we're not for everybody. That's for sure. I've worked with some amazing yeah. clients um, well, they're all amazing on one level because, you know, I'll say that because they pay, they put food on my table. They, they support my career. They let me come in in black t-shirts and jeans and go into their boardrooms and tell them, you know, how to, how to manipulate their brand. So first of all, thank you to every client that I've ever worked with and everybody should thank their clients for sure. Um, but it's about fit. It's about 
having a, um, a similar point of view on the world and the way that we work. Um, sometimes our, our way of working, the chaos that we put ourselves into, the questions we ask, we like to say, we question everything. Don't take it personal. It's not about I'm questioning you. It's challenging what's there. And we always look at things instead of validating why it's right. We look at it and try to say why it's wrong because that makes us look at it in, from a different perspective, right? So, um, you know, your, your question has about three or four very, very deep other questions in there. But, <laughs> right. you know, it's kind of the, the, the bigger, the bigger uh, point to it is we try to find brands and clients that are culturally fit to us, that, that believe in the things that we believe in, that want to produce great work, that want to, to not just be disruptive for disruptive sake, but they have a purpose behind their brand. Um, and, they, mm-hmm. and they want to challenge us creatively. We want, we want clients to not, what we like to say, play malicious obedience. That doesn't help anybody to go, oh yeah, that's great. I love it. Uh, yeah, we could all love it, but, but why is it right? And push us. We want to be pushed, right? So there's that. Um, and quite frankly, we just don't want any jerk clients. We don't want to be jerks. I don't want to employ anybody that's a jerk. I've worked at places like that. Everybody listening probably has a place where they work where they have jerks around them. I, I think that's detrimental. It's, it's a virus to creativity. So we work with people that we like, you know, and, and we go in with our initial um, meetings, whether it's a pitch or or just an initial meeting, meet and greet. And it's as much us vetting them as it is them vetting us. And, and we've We've talked to them about that. We, we feel very strongly that we need to finish each other's sentences. Um, we're in this together and we're on the same team and our goal is their goal. And we want to make sure that we're putting out great, amazing work collectively because it's not all about us. We don't know their business as well as they know their business. We start to learn and understand their business and bring them new insights and ways to look at it from a creative point of view. Um, but the relationship is everything. So we look for that first and foremost. And then, you know, if a client comes in and says, um, this is the work we'd like to do, but we're not doing it. That's a red flag. I go, why aren't you doing it? Is it because your agency's not giving it to you? Because I guarantee you, there's you probably work with a lot of agencies that want to do that kind of work too. There's probably something in there. Um, uh, it, it's a little bit of a, a watch out when clients have a lot of agency turnover and mm-hmm. you start to realize, like, you know, there's um, the, you know, there's obviously a problem. I think when there's there's a relationship problem, it just doesn't work, you know. And we've had some clients that we loved and and we thought were great, wonderful brands and and big, huge brands that any agency would want to work with, and and the relationship didn't work out for whatever reason. And and we were okay with that, and they were okay with that too. And it's okay to walk away from something that's not right because in the end, it's uh you know you produce your best work when your heart is into it. When it becomes work, then it's a problem. I like to say, if you change one word in, in, in your vocabulary, it changes everything. When you say, I have to do something versus I get to do something, totally different point of view. And you want to come in and work with clients that allow you to do something that, you know, where you can say, man, I get to do this new project with them. So that enthusiasm for the work and for their brand and for what we produce is, is infectious. Um, you know, like I said before, nothing beats the work. I, you know, being out here doing things like this, really putting your points of view out there. I think a lot of clients have come to us because they go to our website or they know us through somebody else or they find out us about find out about us and they go, wow, nobody's talking about the industry like you're talking. And nobody's, you know, speaking to your values like you're like you're speaking. And they go, wow, we want to, we want to know more about that. So you know, Andre is an amazing CEO when it comes to um, running the company, but also he's he's an amazing strategist, creative strategist. Um, just not that he's great at looking at creative, but he he understands creative problems very very well. So between him and I and our kind of yin yang of craftsmanship and bringing all that together, his creative strategy. Oftentimes, clients come to us because of our passion for sure, our philosophies, and our ability to take a step back and and ask the dumb questions in a room. I'm not afraid to ask a dumb question. I'll be the dumbest person in the room. Um, you know, the only one dumber is Andre sometimes because he, he really digs. And, and that's okay because you want to yeah. ask the questions at a level that help you comprehend because comprehension is everything. You're never going to nod and grin and walk away from something and go, yeah, perfect. I got it. There's always another question. There's always another question. There's always a different way to look at it. And so I think clients come to us because we challenge them as much as they challenge us, but we do it with great purpose, right? Nobody wants somebody just flipping the bird at them. You know what I mean? That's not what it's not drunken pirates. We're not disruption for disruption disruption sake. You know, we do it with great purpose. We have to understand 
what we're trying to achieve. And, and, you know, we've walked into a a client, there is a a company called Karma Automotive that we were um, helping them launch their first uh, car, which used to be a Fisker. And now it's Karma. And they came to us to just help them strategize around their car launch. And I remember walking into that meeting with Andre and, um, you know, they're, 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 you know, big GM guys that kind of split off and did their own thing. And so they're like expecting, they're expecting a certain demeanor, I guess. So we walked in there Mm -hmm. And uh, they asked us, well, you know, what do you, what, what, what do you have to say? And I said, well, first of all, nobody cares about your stupid car. <laughs> and um, I think we said it like that too, not to be mean or anything, but we needed to grab some attention, right? And I think yeah. that's what you really do. You grab some attention and go, let me tell you why. Because the audience in which you're talking to, and you will go down this rabbit hole of, you know, they probably mm-hmm. got three cars already. You know, they don't need another electric car, or hybrid car, blah, blah, blah. And you get to the point. The point being was that you cannot the world didn't need another luxury um, hybrid vehicle. That's not what they were selling. They weren't selling a luxury hybrid vehicle. What they were selling was the philosophy behind the design of the vehicle, which is beautiful. Um, uh, Its origin story, which was here in California, um, made of the earth. And that this was a car that um, someone of that caliber that would drive this car would want to drive. We were inventing desire, creating an emotional connection and I think that's what design does, right? It, it viscerally connects on an emotional level. Um, and we can never forget that. I think that's, that's really important for us to remember. That's really great. Um, one, one other project and client you were talking about a little bit to me um, before the top of the show was with Western Digital. And I knew it was a project you were starting to get excited about and telling me a little bit about it. And I was like, no, 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 let's save that for the show. So tell me about what's going on with Western Digital. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say all the things that I can, obviously. Um, we do a lot for Western Digital. They have, um, they have three different uh, verticals um, within their brand. So we work across all of their verticals, but we're currently working on uh, a line of products that is, um, that's geared towards gamers. Um, but overall, I think in general, when I think about the tech industry, it's really interesting because when you start to look at the, the tech industry, you'd think that they're very, very sophisticated in a lot of areas, and they are. But what happens with the tech industry is oftentimes you have a lot of engineers there that um, make their products and understand their products at a, at, at a functional level. And Western Digital is not like, you know, unlike any other of the tech brands that I've worked with in the past, LG or, or Logitech or any of those, they struggle with relevance to their audience, right? So what we're doing now, and I think all brands do these days for sure, so what really drives me and what really is getting me excited these days is, is that functional to emotional benefit. And I mentioned it earlier, it's really trying to hone in on how does that functional benefit, you know, or, or that functionality benefit me emotionally? Like what the heck does it do for me? Um, and, and really trying to figure out creative ways to articulate that and quite frankly, visualize that, right? Art and copy have to come together yeah, and they totally. have to speak. Um, you know, and I'm of the mindset, I'm, I'm a little bit, um, you know, simple in my, uh, design sense, um, and in the way that I, I look at, at marketing and advertising. So from a design proposition, number one, we always say, just make me want to look at the thing. It's got to look pretty. <laughs> I just, I don't want it to, I don't want it to be offensive to my eyes. You know, I just want it to, I just want to be able to look at it, but I always look at it and go in human nature. You know, I ask everybody to do this when they walk into a room next time that they've never been into, it's the fight or flight sort of syndrome, right? The first thing you do is you, you take a pause and you kind of glance around the room and you start to go, where's the windows and doors? Where's the breathable yeah. space? How do I work my way in or out of this? And I go, a, a visual design's no different. And so we gotta we, we gotta think about that. And then and then you know, when I when I think about the work and how design and, and what I'm doing for tech is like tech is very um, well, technical, right? I mean, there's a lot of what we like to call speeds and feeds, and taking those speeds and feeds out of it and go, but why? does the 10,000 gigawatts benefit me? I think that's really fascinating to me right now because I have to, you know, and the team here is really starting to look at it and go, but, but like the headphones you're using, the microphone you're using right now, the computers we use, the phones, um, I think Apple does a really good job of it. I think Samsung's been doing a pretty good job of it. And our goal is to bring that level of thinking to Western Digital, which is hard drives, right? We, it's storage, it's data. But at the end of the day, data is extremely important. I even joked with you when we started this and said, hey, you should get some Western digital hard drives for all <laughs> <Right>. your podcasts. <laughs> um, My first uh, attempt to hit record totally failed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, exactly back, in the day, 
back in the day it was filming the camera and now it's, it's, um, you know, we're all content creators now and, and it's, it's data and data is king and, and, and advertising and marketing. Um, it used to be the discretionary dollar. How do I get you to part with your, your, your dollar? Now it's time, right? We spend a lot of time on things and you think about the, the, the phone in our pockets. And, you know, like I said, somebody can pick up an iPhone and be the next Fellini for sure. Um, we're just creating content and consuming content at such an in, immense, you know, pace that the tech world needs to keep up with that. And so we're working on projects right now that um, are amazing. They're amazing technology that we get to work with and with an amazing company. They're very, very forward thinking in the way that they're approaching all this. And it's great to solve those communication problems and those visual problems to really simplify it and, and make it connect on a human level um, when you're talking about something that's very inanimate, like a piece of technology. All right. So this may be a big shift in gears, but um, I'm curious if you have anything that stands out to you as one of your proudest professional moments. Uh, 100%. I've been doing this a long, long time. And obviously we like to say we love all our children, but we always have to pick one to send to Harvard. Um, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a joke. Um, none of my kids have gone to Harvard. Uh, but one in particular happened about three years ago, our CEO, Andre Phillips sits on the board of Easter seals and, um, here in Southern California. And so he has a great relationship with them. And if you don't know who Easter seals is, please go Google it and look it up. Your parents probably know about it. They are a 100 year organization, um, that benefits or, or, you know, um, has services that help people living with disability. And so, you know, throughout my career, I've always wanted, everybody wants to make the next, you know, big, wonderful, just do it, got milk, whatever that is. Of course you want to do that. But more importantly to me, and after winning awards and doing different things throughout my career, making an impact on the world and humanity, you know, mm -hmm. and really doing something that, that makes sense, um, that pushes that bar forward a little bit. Um, really was something that was a big goal of mine. So they came to us and said, Hey, nobody knows us. They wanted a branding campaign and they wanted to change the way people see and view disability. So we launched a campaign called celebrate don't separate, um, three years ago. And, um, it was all over Southern California, LA, San Diego, all over the place. Um, and, uh, we launched it and it was, you know, very typographically driven. Um, and then some video work that was around it and some digital work. And, but it, it really came from really understanding how we all perceive people living with disability and, and disability and, and, and inclusion in, in general. And uh, we launched it and we we're really proud to put that out there because it was it's very altruistic, you know, and I love doing that kind of stuff. But about three days after it launched, um, we get a call and the call was from the client saying, Hey, listen, the uh, Smithsonian Institute reached out to us and they saw your work um, out in, while they're visiting LA at another museum. And they would like to know if you would be okay if they included it in the archives as a, wow. as a, as a you know, a good representation of um, communication uh, when it comes to really affecting the world, when it comes to uh, per perception of, of inclusion and disability. So, you know, oh, probably really one of my awesome. power, most, most, you know, proud moments was that was because it's not about, you know, a gold lion or a Clio or some award show statue, which, you know, those are all great. And I love that. Um, but that work's going to sit in the freaking Smithsonian forever. <laughs> and awesome. somebody hopefully a hundred years from now will be able to go back in it and say, you know, wow, that, that, that was, you know, held up as some of the most powerful communication of its time. So absolutely by far my most proud moment. Um, I'm curious, Los, if you have any, um, it could be agency designers, creatives of all shapes and sizes. Any, any heroes that you looked up to kind of coming up in the biz or folks that you look up to now that you're inspired by? Uh, yeah, there's been plenty, but I'm going to name three in particular and they're so freaking disparate. You're going to laugh at these, but, um, number one, Saul Bass, if you're a designer and you don't know and love Saul Bass, I'm a student of the world and student of, you know, uh, design and advertising. I'd love you know, you can learn so much from those days and, and being a little bit hands-on when I first started, you know, I was fascinated with um, his approach and, mm, you know, yeah. it's aesthetic for sure. And then obviously the, the, the posters, but also what I didn't know that I loved as Saul Bass's at the time was um, his branding. You know, he's, he's yeah. made some incredible logos and brand marks that communicated um, to the world and, and, and really left the mark. Um, 
So Saul Bass for sure. And then there's a guy, I don't know if you know him, listen to a lot of music, a lot of indie music uh, growing up and love the music label 4AD, um, which had a designer named Von Oliver uh, doing a lot of their album covers. So it was like for bands like Lush, Trash Can Sinatra's, um, all of that. And Von Oliver back in the early 90s, you know, really started to bring a design aesthetic that was provocative and just totally changed the way that I, I mean, I bought album cover albums based on covers, man. I just went in there. So holy yeah, crap, totally. this looks incredible. And I know we all have done that, but what was so cool about it and really influenced me as a designer was the music inspired his art. And so he spent a lot of time understanding the music and then he let that, that, that feeling, that emotion of the music really influence what he was doing. Um, you know, and it, he just brought in a way of bringing an ethereal, you know, aspect to um, music, which I thought was very, very cool and and very disruptive at the time, and and just kind of really aligned with a lot of my thinking. Um, and then lastly, I didn't tell this story, but my my father uh, worked at a hospital, and I was very young. Uh, I must have been five years old or something like that. And I was walking through the parking lot um, with him, you know, as he was going back to the quote unquote office uh, one day, and I remember catching a glimpse of a bright green, like 911 Porsche at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I mentioned this to you. I'm a huge car guy. I love Formula One racing. I love Indy racing. I love GT racing. I love cars in general. And I absolutely was enamored and fell in love with Porsche design. So Ferdinand Porsche, for the fact that he brought not just engineering, but a design aesthetic at the time that nobody was doing and still holds up today, right? It's such timeless mm -hmm. design. Yeah that you look at a, a, a 9-11 and you go, that line, it's, it's, yeah. it's iconic, right? And, and so when you look at those, you can see that graphic design from Saul Bass, incredible ethereal thinking from Von Oliver, and just um, um, amazing, in, impeccable attention to detail from Ferdinand Porsche. It, it, it all relates. And then obviously there's a ton of advertising guys in there too that I could go on forever. But I think those that have really influenced my career and I always go back to it and go, wow, they, I, I just admire them for sure. It would be those three. That's awesome. That's a great list. I would, uh, definitely, uh, underscore the Saul Bass one for sure. If you guys don't have that Saul Bass coffee table book, there's some amazing stuff in there. Just as a great, uh, kind of cursory overview of that guy's work. Amazing stuff. Um, so this is the question that I ask every guest of the show because it's kind of the theme of the show. Um, but I find that we creative types are obsessed with many things throughout our careers off and on. Um, and so this can be anything life or work or otherwise, but I'm curious what you find you are most obsessed with right now. Oh my gosh. Um, I think I've mentioned it a few times. What am I most obsessed with? Wow. That is, that's hard, man, because you know, if you're any kind of creative person, you got about a thousand things rattling in your head at any given right. time. Um, I, I'll, I'll try to get, I think most obsessed right now with is my energy. And I'm going to tell you this and why I think this, and I'm going to go down the list of some functional things as well, because it's hard to pick one, but energy is everything to me. Um, you know, I mentioned it earlier, you know, being self-aware of how you are on a day-to-day -day basis affects those that you're working with around you and your work. Like you come in and you're bummed out you're going to do crappy work. That's just all there is to it. So <laughs> right. I'm obsessed with, with, with my energy and, and making sure that I every day, you know, sort of unconditionally around me that I put myself in a great mood, whatever that means, whether that's a cup of coffee, a, a great piece of music that I'm listening to on my commute or whatever. Um, you know, I, I try really hard to be obsessed with that because the ultimate is the work, right? I'm always obsessed with the work, but that's the answer that everybody always gives. I think, you know, so that at a, at a sort of personal slash business level, yeah, that one, I, I, I love being obsessed with my energy. Um, and you know, like the idea we see and what we make in here has lasting effects up there. And I think we need to be aware of that, but on a, on a personal, personal level is I'm a car guy, man. I am obsessed with car design and watches. <laughs> my wife is, uh, my wife thinks I'm absolutely insane because I'm asking for a new watch all the time. And she's like, what, what about the one I just got you? And I'm like, that one's cool, but this one's cool too. So I love the precision of, um, you know, race cars and I love the precision of, of, of watches. So I'm, I've been really obsessed with, with kind of digging into the heritage of racing. Like I mentioned Porsche before, um, you know, the fact that in the, 
sixties, they had some amazing engineering in there, like disc brakes on a car that shouldn't have disc brakes back then, you know? And to this day, you know, you look at like formula one and you're in Indianapolis. And, um, I told you how much I love IndyCar racing and, you know, the, um, not just the attention to detail, the engineering, the design that goes into that and how it all comes together to benefit the greater goal, right? Which is to win, to be the best. Um, so I'm obsessed with, with that notion and, and really going, how today can I learn from, from those industries and look at stuff and go, wow, it's going to influence how I think, how I work, how I exist on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Fun fact about, uh, IndyCar and you, you probably know way more about IndyCar than, than I do. And I'm right here in the hotbed of it. But, um, I was really interested when I first learned that the, the track was founded as a proving grounds for the automobile industry. In fact, like to do the Indy 500 right now, it seems like, oh, it just, it's a long time to be in a race car, but it was originally like, will your car go 500 miles? Like, can we get past over the river and through the woods to the grandmother's house? Like, can we, can we go further than that? Is it safe to do that? Can you, you know, test and introduce these new technologies? But um, I think that's a really cool part of the whole auto racing scene is this idea of introducing new tech and figuring out like how you can perform better with these new technologies. Oh, 100%. I'm fascinated with that stuff too. And I'm sure everybody listening, if you haven't checked it out, please check it out. If you don't love cars, it's still a great movie, Ford versus Ferrari. Mm, so An good. amazing, so, so good. good. <laughs> shot the ink crap out of that movie. It's so good. Acting's amazing, but the story is really great too. And really what that is, is, is sort of, it's creativity at its best, right? It's engineers and creative thinkers going out and saying, how can we better ourselves? How can we make yeah. something better than the next guy? How can we beat ourselves, right? There's a great 9-11 commercial recently, eh, probably within the last year or two that I saw. It was amazing. It was just like a 9-11 and it's driving and the voiceover kind of continues. And it shows it, it shows like Muhammad Ali and it's Muhammad Ali boxing Muhammad Ali, right? It's like Kobe playing against Kobe kind mm-hmm. of thing. And it says the only car capable of beating the 9-11 is a 9-11. And I thought that was great because it, the message is so apropos of what we've been talking about. And it's like pushing yourself and, and trying to better yourself is great. So yeah, coming out of that in the endurance races, like the 24-hour races, Le Mans, 24 Hours of Daytona, all of those are all about proving the vehicle's design and technology and engineering, right? And also the stamina of the drivers behind it. So a lot of auto racing came out of uh, creative people challenging each other to be better. Yeah. And it, the latest thing to come out of Indy is this autonomous race that they've been talking about and happening soon. So um, that gets me excited because that, that gets back to like, we're actually proving something. We're not just, you know, changing how high the fin can be or how big the wheel is, but we're, we're actually doing something totally different. Like it not, it, it's back to like, is it safe to be in this car to go 500 miles while nobody's steering it? <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's a big test to me. Yeah, for sure. And again, like I said earlier, I think it comes down to theory and practice coming together. I think great design um, really is taking a, a theoretical idea and putting it into, in, into practical application. And, and, and that's what we do. We, we take, you know, I always say it, it, what we do is not easy. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult. And, um, y- you know, there's nothing harder than to create something from nothing. And that's exactly what we do every single day of our lives. We come in and we stare at a blank wall or a blank piece of paper, whatever it is, or a blank screen, and we got to make something. And, you know, there's not a lot of people that can just go, I got this idea. How about we do it like this? Mm -hmm. And not afraid to fail and to fail fast and to, you know, iterate and to be okay with, you know, building the same wall 10 times over the course of a week, you know, until you, until you find the right way to build that wall. You know, I think that's, uh, that, that's what we do. And we equate it to, um, the Teddy Roosevelt speech, the man in the arena and look it up kids. If you yeah, good don't stuff. know it, but it's about being the man in the arena takes the hits and everybody's a critic around them, but it's really the person that's in there taking the hits that knows, um, knows great defeat is the only way that you're going to know great success. And I think that's what we deal with every single day. And, you know, um, we have our souls crushed <laughs> every day, <laughs> but then we pick ourselves back up and, you know, I heard it, I heard it said this way, uh, recently and I thought it was a fantastic analogy, but it's like, we're, we're, um, the Phoenix rising from the ashes every single day. We just yeah. burn ourselves out. And then for some reason, the next project we're born again. And, uh, you know, we're just rise from the ashes and we're, we're chasing it one more time. 
Uh, and it, nothing can be more true. You know, I don't think I'll ever burn out doing this. So I joke with my kids, Hey, when I retire, I'm going to go, you know, be a chef. I'm going to go do all these things. Right. And they go retire. And they just kind of question mark and they go, you're never going to retire. You're going to, you're going to die with a Sharpie <laughs> in your hand. Um, and they're probably right. <laughs> Love it. Well, Louis, I think we could go on for like another hour easily geeking out on this stuff, but um, maybe we'll, we'll wind this down. Um, Before I let you go, uh, I'm curious what your favorite piece of advice you've received is, or what's a common favorite piece of advice that you like to pass along to your creative team? Oh my gosh. Um, There's so many great little bits of wisdom, but you know, I, I don't know if it's one specific piece of advice. I, I kind of touched on it. Um, maybe I didn't, but I always think that there's two things that is very difficult to teach, and that is passion and care. And when you're an artist, you have to have passion and care for the project that you're working on. It doesn't matter if it, it, it's your you know dream project. You have to find something to fall in love with. So every time you get a project, um, whether it's personal or professional, find something to love about it. Don't hate on it. If you have to hate on it to find something to love about it, do that, but do it very quickly. Because, um, I think, you know, we have to love what we do. We, this is not a, this is not a career choice, at least not for me. It's never been a career choice. This is a way of life. And Mm. my advice to every young creative out there is, is love what you do. Don't be afraid to ask for help around you. Um, you know, there, there's a creative community and just like myself, just like Josh here, we all love to talk about our, our careers. We've, we've, trust me, I made a ton of mistakes in my life. Um, you know, we've all skinned our knees. We've all been beat up. We've all gone, we're the man in the arena. We've all done it. And there's nothing that I love more than a creative person coming to me going, Hey, I have this problem. Can, can you help me? And I love that too. I've asked for help. So, you know, stay true to who you are, fall in love with your work. Don't be afraid to ask for help and don't, This is the number, this, now I got it. Now the number one thing I'm going to tell everybody is don't ever underestimate the value you bring to the world. Sometimes it's very, very easy to be put into the, um, and everybody knows what I mean when I say this, the sort of production world of you're just there to make something for me, Mm -hmm. right? Certainly we are all there to make something for somebody else on some level, but it's that innate ability to know how to make and what we make. It, it, creativity can, has, will continue to change the world. And that is the most valuable thing on the face of the planet. Yeah, 100%. Carlos, I think you are perhaps a philosopher masquerading as a creative. <laughs> You had so many good. <laughs> that's not, good the, that's not the first time I heard that. You know, oh, someone once called me there. Uh, so I, it was funny when I was having lunch with this uh, this gal once, and she said, "You're like my fortune cookie." <laughs> said, I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> Everybody here calls me Papa Los, and I'm okay with that. That's fine. I, I, you know, I had like I said some great mentors, and and uh, it's it's as you can tell, I'm very passionate about what I do and my way of life, and um, I was fortunate to have people around me that were too. So. You know, if I can give that back and even just a little bit, and uh, if anybody here listening got something out of this, then it makes me super stoked, man. Well, that's awesome. Hey, um, this has been great. Tell our listeners where they can connect with you online or learn more about ELA. Yeah, for sure. So you can go to ela1.com. That's ela, the number one.com. You can find us on the Instagrams at ELA Advertising. Um, and then if you link in me or Google search, I'm, I'm out there too, or Andre's out there as well. Awesome. Well, Los, it has been a pleasure chatting with you today. Thanks so much for being on the show. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me, Josh. Yeah. And thanks for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids. That's episode number 143 in the books. This episode is brought to you by Yellow Images. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com. 
to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.